A useless old fart who can't even make any sales deserves to be axed. Working as a designer at an apparel company, I was assigned a patent development project by our parent company to help boost sales. Yet, it turned out to be nothing more than dumping a troublesome task on me, who's nearing retirement. Still, aiming to go out with a bang, I decided to dive into the patent development research. Then, one day, a beautiful new department head, Smith, got transferred to our department. However, she was only interested in short-term gains and lambasted me for not delivering results. Okay, I said, after submitting a budget proposal for some research, only to be mocked by her, pushing me to my breaking point. Taking her advice to heart, I quit and swiftly landed a new gig at a different company. And lo and behold, I managed to secure a patent, but then strange things started happening around me. My name is Kenny, and I'm 61 years old. I'm a fashion designer assigned to the planning department of an apparel company. For about 40 years, I've been designing clothes, but the company's performance has been declining year by year. We've been overtaken by rival companies one after the other. As well as young, talented designers are launching their own brands, stealing our customers. I'm close to retirement age, and lately, I've been told my sense of style is outdated. I've worked for this company for many years, but it might be time to move on. One day, we received a directive from our parent company to start a new venture. Their strategy is to begin a patent development project to improve sales. Our company has never obtained a patent before, and neither has it developed any original technology. Getting out of the red for us will require essential licensing agreements with other companies. Therefore, I, in the planning department, was assigned the entire responsibility for the patent development project. When my boss told me about this, I was utterly shocked. Me, in charge of a new project. It was a mystery as to why I was given this sudden major role. When I asked my boss why, he said it was because of my long service and extensive knowledge as a designer. But there are many other younger, more reliable employees besides me. Initially, I requested to be excused from the assignment, but after my boss earnestly requested, I reluctantly accepted. Having accepted, I resolved to devote my full effort to the project, but my determination soon began to waver. The room prepared for the business project was like a dim, dirty warehouse. The only things installed were a wobbly office desk and chair. When I tried placing a water bottle on the desk, it immediately rolled off and fell to the floor. Seeing this situation, I realized something. Though the parent company ordered the launch of a new project, they weren't really interested. That's why my boss dumped this makeshift job on me, an old employee, trying to make it look like they were doing something. It's just a guess, but seeing this filthy room, I can't help but conclude that. In my younger days, I worked hard. Receiving trust and praise from those around me, but now I've become someone dumped with troublesome tasks. The gap between then and now has me completely disheartened. I guess it's finally time for me to be put out to pasture. Leaning back in a chair that creaks every time I sit down, I let out a heavy sigh. While just coasting along until retirement isn't the worst idea, deep down, I honestly want to leave on a high note. All right, retirement's around the corner, so I might as well go all out with whatever I can do. If the higher-ups aren't enthusiastic, then I'll just do as I please. Motivating myself, I started by cleaning up the room. There are numerous steps to obtaining a patent. Including planning, research, applying to the patent office for rights, and utilizing the acquired patent. Creating something unprecedented isn't easy. However, thorough market research and studying other companies' patents can reveal what needs to be done. I plan to first identify the company's technologies and strengths to develop a groundbreaking fashion style, but as I was planning such, I got a new boss. During the morning assembly, she came in front of the employees and bowed. I've been appointed as the head of the development department, coming from sales, my name is Smith. Smith, as she introduced herself, smiled warmly at the employees. Despite being 43, Smith, with her attractive features, had the male employees smitten. Given her beauty, I, too, couldn't help but feel my heart skip a beat around her. After the assembly ended, the male employees rushed over to Smith. Apparently, she's a gem with a track record of accomplishments as a former salesperson. She was promoted due to her excellent reputation with clients and outstanding work performance. Holding a faint hope that Smith, now my boss, might cooperate with the patent development, I felt somewhat optimistic. Manager Smith, nice to meet you, I'm Kenny, designer and part of the patent development division. I introduced myself to her. 
Up close, Smith's features were sharp, and she was so beautiful that her minor wrinkles were hardly noticeable. If she were younger, I bet all the employees would have been lining up to propose to her. When our eyes met, Smith smiled warmly. Nice to meet you, Mr. Kenny, I've also been assigned to oversee this new venture. Really, having you as our manager is so reassuring. So, how is the progress coming along? With that, Smith commanded me to show her the ongoing data. However, since we had just launched the project, we hadn't even reached the research phase yet. So, there was no data to show. Ah. Uh. I'm sorry, we're still in the planning phase, so there's no data yet. I said, apologetically bowing my head. Glancing at her expression, I noticed the calm smile had vanished, replaced by a look of displeasure. What, are you actually working, the parent company has high expectations, and here you are, dawdling. Her sudden sharp tone took me by surprise. No. Uh. Sorry, I am indeed handling my tasks properly, but. Then stop dawdling and get to work. Yes, ma'am. Confused by her sudden change in attitude, I hurried back to my desk to resume my tasks. I quickly put together a plan and had Smith review it, but. A plan this half-baked will never get a patent approved, do it over. She said, pushing the documents back to me. At that moment, I thought Smith was just strict about work. However, I later found out that she was a sales supremacist who only measured value in numbers. Two weeks had passed since launching the project. While juggling my designer duties, I diligently pursued research for the invention. After numerous rejections, my plan was finally accepted, and I progressed to the research stage. However, since no other employees were willing to help, the development was challenging. Despite being my boss, Smith only contributed by checking documents and stamping approvals. In the end, I was essentially the only one involved in the project. Even in such solitary conditions, I sometimes worked overtime to achieve patent acquisition. If the patent were approved, I would be recognized as an inventor and receive a bonus. Retiring after accomplishing such a significant task would leave me with no regrets. So, despite the setbacks, I continued my research day after day without giving up. A month later, hmm, it still doesn't quite hit the mark. I feel like I'm on the verge of grasping something, yet I can't come up with the ideal fashion concept. It's like groping through fog. At that moment, the door to the division flew open. Kenny, how's the research going, you better not be slacking off. Yes, yes. Since transferring to the development department, Smith has become known as a fearsome boss, feared not just by me but by all employees. Initially attracted by her beauty, we've all come to fear her for her strictness and Spartan schedules. Hurry up and secure the patent to boost sales, that's what you were tasked with, wasn't it? Well, I mean, it was more like it was thrust upon me, unwillingly. Her stern words made me falter, but arguing back only added fuel to the fire. No excuses, people who make excuses because they can't do their job are as good as useless, I don't need trash under my command. Ugh. Being called useless was a shock, no matter how you sliced it. In fact, the research wasn't progressing as hoped, and we were nowhere near ready to apply for a patent. If you don't want to quit, then start producing results. With those orders, Smith returned to her station. On her first day after the transfer, I had reluctantly shown her around the department's room. But she refused to even enter, saying, this is not a fitting workplace for me. I didn't want to work in such a dusty room either, but I wasn't in a position to complain. To gain Smith's approval, I need to file for a patent quickly and get it granted. Being berated by her every day, I'm painfully aware of my own shortcomings. Yet, I was desperate to make the patent development a success. Ugh. No good, this method won't invent a brand that's yet to appear in the world. Even as my motivation returned, I couldn't produce good results right away and fell into a slump again. I've conducted numerous experiments and research iterations, all of which have failed. With each failure, Smith's scrutiny intensified. Feeling stuck, I decided to halt the ongoing research and start over from scratch. Let's think this through once more, why hasn't our company ever had a patent before? Unlike major apparel brands, our company is just one of many small to mid-sized enterprises. If a new product doesn't sell, we could go bankrupt immediately. To beat the big players, we have no choice but to enhance our strengths even further. For that, we need to acquire a strong weapon, a patent. 
Until now, I had been focused only on eccentric designs and innovative fashion styles. However, I decided to look at things from a different perspective and revisited surveys from our customers. That's when I found a hint. People want materials that feel better on their skin. Now I get it, I had been so concerned with appearances that I hadn't focused on the materials. The moment I muttered this, it was as if the fog in my mind cleared, and something awakened within me. This is it, with a clear goal in sight, I immediately rewrote the project plan. I considered using naturally derived substances as biomaterials. This would mean developing a kind of biotechnology. But if this invention succeeds, it might attract attention not just for a patent, but from around the world. Since it's derived from nature, it could also contribute to combating global warming and reducing CO2 emissions. If successful, my name could be remembered for generations a remarkable achievement. However, this research comes with problems. It requires a vast amount of time and budget to proceed. Despite already being in a rush to develop, asking for more time and budget might not sit well with the higher-ups. But faced with such a significant possibility, I couldn't stay still. To get approval for the research from Smith, I compiled various statistics and created a document showing the probability of success with concrete numbers. All right, with this documentation, I'm sure I can persuade her to approve the budget. Filled with determination, I headed to Smith's desk. Smith, may I have a moment, please? Why are you shouting like that? She looked at me suspiciously, noticing a different vibe from me than usual. I hope you're making progress with that research, if you can't produce results, it's the same as slacking off. I have a consultation regarding that. I presented the documentation to her. What's this? It's a development plan for a new material to be used in clothing. Focusing on the material of the clothes. It explores the possibility of developing a material that is kind to both the earth and human skin. Smith flipped through the document I had prepared. Then, without really reading it, she scoffed and laughed through her nose. What's this pointless plan, as if the company would spend money on such a childish research? Smith tore up the plan in front of me, scattering it on the floor. After seeing the plan I had worked so hard on being ridiculed and torn up, I was furious. What are you doing, there's no need to tear it up. Shut up, someone who can't do their job properly has no right to speak so grandly. She's probably irritable because the company isn't doing well. Lately, she's been yelling at other employees for trivial reasons, using it as a way to vent her stress. I had hoped she might cooperate, but Smith is just focused on immediate profits, disregarding her employees. I'm just giving my all to the patent development because I was tasked with this new project. That's your all. Maybe the task was too much for an incompetent old man after all. Her cruel words made me clench my fists tightly. But still, I tried to reason with her calmly. If the development of this new material succeeds, it could attract worldwide attention, right, that could lead to gains far beyond simple sales. So you're saying we need this ridiculously high budget for that? Smith stepped on the plan scattered across the floor, clearly looking down on me. The budget is for purchasing equipment necessary for the research, please approve the increase in budget. I waited for her response. Without Smith's approval, the research couldn't proceed. And without it, the new venture was bound to fail. I prayed in my heart for her approval, but her reply was a betrayal. A useless old man who can't even make any sales deserves to be fired. Smith called me useless and ordered me to leave. I was infuriated by her attitude, constantly criticizing without offering any support despite being the manager. Understood. With just that, I turned my back on Smith. Oh, where do you think you're going? If a, a useless old man can't deliver results, then it's time for him to take his leave. Goodbye. Without looking back, I said this and walked away from her. Then, at my desk, I filled out my resignation letter and went back to her. It was a brief time, but I've been under your care, Smith. I placed the paper marked resignation letter on her desk. Smith looked back and forth, between me and the resignation letter, her eyes wide in surprise. Huh, are you serious? Things would be better off without that no good old man, wouldn't they? With a hint of sarcasm in her words, Smith furrowed her brow. That's right, younger employees have a future, unlike old timers like you, just go away, will you? Shaken to hear that I was seriously considering leaving, Smith quickly flashed a spiteful smile. All right then, goodbye. As I slightly bowed and began to gather my things, Smith called out to stop me. 
Wait, before you disappear, take care of the trash you've scattered all over the floor. Scattered at her feet were pieces of the project plan. The stepped-on pieces of paper were marred with footprints, beyond repair. However, since the data still existed on my computer, I could print as many copies as needed. Cleaning up this mess will be your last task. Understood. I knelt down and silently began picking up the scattered pieces of paper. While some employees wanted to help out of sympathy. Smith yelled at them, mind your own business, this man doesn't need your help. As I reached for the last piece of paper, Smith was smirking down at me. That spiteful look in her eyes made my blood boil with anger. After all this time, to end up like this is just embarrassing, she said. At that moment, I realized something. No matter how beautiful a person is on the outside, if they have a rotten core and use vile words, they're as good as ugly. If she had been cooperative from the beginning and had supported my plan, I wouldn't have felt this sad. Just to confirm, you're okay with discarding my proposal and research data, right? Of course, that trash data isn't worth a penny. I see, then, let's pretend this data never existed. Holding the scraps of paper, I left the department. A month later, after completing the resignation process, I left the company and started looking for a new job. I could have taken early retirement, but I didn't want to waste the research data I had worked hard to create. So, I decided to reach out to companies that might find my research data useful, one by one. A week later, while I was at home, my cell phone rang. Hello, this is Kenny speaking, you're interested in my research. I quickly changed into a business suit and headed to the location of the caller. The caller was a bio-research lab, known experts in the materials field. They research biomaterials and create clothing that is friendly to both the natural environment and humans. Such a company expressed strong interest in my research data and wanted to meet to discuss it further. Trying to contain my excitement, I hurried to the company. Then, I met with the head of the research institute, who listened eagerly to my research data. The reaction was the complete opposite of what I got from Smith, which made me speak passionately. Then, they offered me a position so that we might develop things together. But, alongside my happiness, anxiety crept in. I'm an old man nearing retirement, but can I really be of use to you? I am aware of my own physical decline and being elderly. Moreover, I had been scorned by Smith as a, a useless old man. So, I worried that by changing jobs, I might become a burden to them. However, the head told me, there are researchers older than yourself all around the world, there's no need to fear age. Reinvigorated with a spirit of challenge, I managed to land a job at a new company. I was warmly welcomed by the new colleagues I met, who highly valued my track record as a designer and my research data. Such a response was something I could never have expected at my previous job, almost bringing me to tears. All right, let's give it another shot. Motivated, I delved into my research. And six months later, my efforts finally materialized into a biomaterial, and we succeeded in obtaining a patent. This achievement earned acclaim from researchers and companies worldwide, and the company secured sponsorship deals. Not only that, but my name appeared in a renowned science magazine. And suddenly, I was in the spotlight, swamped with TV interviews as an inventor. I'm a designer by profession, but I never thought I'd become a researcher. Yet, seeing my research take shape and knowing it will be useful in the future fills me with pride. While celebrating with the colleagues I worked with, my cell phone rang. The caller is, huh, this number is. Recognizing the phone number, I felt a sense of foreboding. With trepidation, I answered the phone, and a familiar voice resonated in my ear. You, traitor. It was my former boss, Smith. How dare you betray our company? Betray, what are you talking about? I left the company, but I never intended to betray anyone. I read the magazine, how dare you obtain a patent so boldly after leaving. I resigned and then immediately found a new job, it's there that I continued my research, which led to the patent being approved. I don't understand why you called me with this accusation. It doesn't seem like she's just venting work stress. Basically, the research was originally developed here, right, then, that patent belongs to us. Patents invented at the company belong to the company. Those words made me realize something immediately. I see, so, I'm a, a traitor because I took a patent that belongs to the company and made it mine. That patent belongs to us, return it immediately. While I was on the phone with her, my company's boss looked at me worriedly. When I told him that the caller was the department head from my former workplace, he frowned. 
Furthermore, running off with the company's proposal is sabotage. We will demand damages from you. Damages, you say? Well, yes, because you ran off with the company's documents. I sighed in disbelief at Smith's claim. Remembering the conversation I had with her when I left, I responded very calmly. You know, it was you, the department head, who told me to discard the research data I worked on. Huh, I don't know anything about that. Moreover, it was you who tore up the documents I created into pieces and called them trash. Yet, Smith continued to feign ignorance, claiming she didn't remember. Her tendency to play dumb about inconvenient truths was starting to irritate me. Then, please confirm it with the CEO and our superiors. Since you were the only one I showed those documents to, no one else should know about them. How dare you order me around, you impudent old man. Smith became even more displeased when I made my request. This was turning into a pointless argument about who stole what. However, when I left the company, I definitely confirmed whether it was all right to discard the research data. And Smith admitted it was unnecessary. So, I merely reused it. There is no fault on my part. Anyway, you were the one who ordered the research data to be discarded. Once you let go of it, the rights to the patent belong to us. Stop being so stubborn. I was getting tired of this endless argument. I could just end the call, but then she might keep calling back persistently. I don't want to cause any trouble for the company, so I'd really like to cut ties here and now. After some thought, I decided to choose a somewhat forceful method. All right. Oh, finally decided to admit your fault, huh, then, hand over the patent to us quickly. Thinking I had given in, Smith's tone became cheerfully presumptuous. But I had no intention of handing it over. I'll contact your company's president to see if he's aware of the research content. Huh. I ended the call on my cell phone and contacted my former workplace using the company's landline. I immediately asked for the president to verify the facts. To put it simply, the president was not aware of the content of my research. Far from it, it was revealed that Smith hadn't reported anything to him. She had misled him about the reason for my resignation, claiming it was for medical treatment. Thus, the president was unaware of the interactions between Smith and I that had led to my resignation. Smith probably reported a convenient lie to the higher-ups to avoid dealing with the hassle. When I explained the real reason for my resignation and the circumstances that led to it, he was greatly disturbed. While on the phone with the president, I heard the sound of a door being forcefully opened from the other end. Next, I heard Smith's frantic voice asking, Who are you talking to? She must have rushed to the president's office in a panic upon hearing I was contacting him. For a while, I could hear their conversation over the phone, but under the president's questioning, she became evasive. You made a false report to me, pressed by this, Smith seemed flustered. I wished I could have been there in person to see her panicked face. Well then, Mr. President, I'll leave the rest in your hands. With those final words, I ended the call with the president. Smith is likely to get a thorough scolding from the president, so things should be peaceful for a while. Hopefully, this experience deters her from ever meddling with me again. Feeling relieved, after finishing work and heading home, I received an email. The sender's name was unknown, but the message was clear. I will make you regret betraying me, it said, a brief message alone. The sender is almost certainly Smith. After getting reprimanded by the president, one would think she'd have learned her lesson, but it seems not. Thinking it was just her bluff, I decided to ignore the email. However, a month later, something strange happened at the company. During work, a call came in, and I picked up the receiver. Hello, this is SCAT Research Institute. There was no reply, and thinking it was a bad connection, I spoke again. This is SCAT Research Institute, may I ask who's calling? Suddenly, the call dropped with a beep. Huh, maybe it was a wrong number. I wondered, but at the time, I thought it was just a wrong number and didn't worry about it. However, an hour after resuming work, the phone rang again. Hello, this is SCAT Research Institute. Again, there was no reply. Two wrong number calls in one day seemed too strange. As I puzzled over these odd occurrences, another employee reported receiving silent calls too. Then, one after another, other employees started raising their hands. It's not just me, everyone's getting silent calls. We looked at each other in the face of this bizarre situation. The call history showed the numbers as private, making it impossible to identify the callers. Then, one employee speculated that the silent calls were probably prank calls from fans. 
Recently, after I invented a patent, I received a TV offer and appeared on a television program for a few minutes. The employees guessed that viewers of the program might have called the Research Institute as a prank. It seems that a few times a year, we get such prank calls, and we've been thoroughly ignoring them without engaging. So, following everyone's lead, I decided not to worry about any silent calls that come in. A few days later, an employee with a pale face approached me. What's wrong, my face is on an internet forum. Prompted by the employee, I accessed the internet forum in question. The forum allowed posts from numerous users, but what I found was shocking. Why are my face and name here? My photo, name, and age were posted on the forum, labeled as a plagiarist. Even my past career and previous job titles were disclosed. Plagiarist old man is society's trash. Someone who plagiarizes has no value in living. Users who saw the posts began to slander and insult me more and more. Realizing that I was being badmouthed behind my back left me speechless and astonished. My colleagues tried desperately to support me. Why me, what have I done? Being subjected to such harsh words by strangers is unbearable. This is the frightening aspect of the internet, I realized with a growing sense of dread. For a while, I was in a daze, watching as more insults about me were posted, but then I noticed something. My photo was posted, but the background was the interior of a pub. Furthermore, I recognized it as a pub frequently used for drinking parties at my former job, sending chills down my spine. Maybe the person who posted this is from my former company. And with that thought, only one person came to mind. It's Smith. So, all those silent calls were from Smith. I muttered unintentionally. Whether the silent calls and the defamation on the bulletin board are from the same person is still unknown. But as I connected the dots, it didn't feel wrong to think it was her doing. I wanted to report this to the police but felt uncertain if it was reportable. Even if I tried to confirm with her, I could already see her feigning ignorance. It's terrible that she's harassing me even after I left the company. I was fed up with her clingy nature. But I couldn't let this go on any longer, causing trouble not just for me but for everyone at the institute. I made up my mind, got permission from my boss, and decided to report it to the police. After the police arrived, I explained the situation in detail. Together with them, I headed to the company where Smith was. Smith and her colleagues were shocked to see me suddenly appear. Why are you here? I'm here to have you arrested. I glared at her sternly and stated firmly. However, she feigned ignorance as if she had no idea what I was talking about. Arrest, I haven't done anything, just a good office lady. I know you leaked my personal information on the internet forum. At my words, Smith twitched, her expression turning serious for a moment. But she quickly returned to a smile, spreading charm. What are you talking about, do you have any proof I did it? Yes. Huh. I took out my cell phone and searched through past emails. I showed her the message she sent about a month ago, saying, I will make you regret betraying me. Do you remember, this could certainly serve as a strong motive. That is. Smith began to shift her gaze nervously, sweating profusely. It appears you sent me this email in a rage, but you've really dug yourself into a hole now. With no room for excuses, Smith was about to be taken away by the police but resisted desperately. It's all your fault, I was just trying to make a profit for the company. She continued to deny her involvement, but ultimately, she was taken to the station. Later, evidence of Smith's posts on online forums was discovered on the computer he used at work. She was arrested for defamation, insult, and for making silent calls, which amounted to obstruction of business. During the interrogation, Smith said, I wanted to get revenge for you stealing the patent from me. Before it was stolen, it was Smith herself who missed the chance to develop the patent. If we had worked together to obtain the patent, it could have belonged to the company, and she wouldn't have been arrested. But no matter how much we talk about what could have been, the crimes committed can't be erased. Smith was found guilty of multiple charges and sentenced to seven years in prison. In fact, after I left, she took on the entire responsibility for the patent development project. However, she couldn't achieve the desired results and ended up lashing out at her subordinates due to stress. As a result, she lost their trust, and this arrest seems to have completely burned bridges with them. Naturally, the subordinates were overjoyed to hear about Smith's arrest. After her arrest, the former president of my company came to apologize to me. He gave me a substantial settlement for the defamation I had suffered. 
which I suspect was also meant as hush money to keep me from speaking out. I accepted the settlement and completely cut ties. The company continued to incur losses and eventually went bankrupt. Ignoring others for the sake of revenue led to Smith not receiving help from anyone, resulting in her cold prison sentence. Even as a beautiful woman, she will likely emerge from the harsh confines of prison a shadow of her former self. After that, the harassment against me and the lab stopped abruptly, and I've been living peacefully. Recently, I've started new research and am thriving in a new field as a designer and researcher.